Um, Uta is the international coordinator of the Christian Initiative International Learning. She, in Germany, and has been in that position since 1985. So, Uta, please. Thank you. Thank you for inviting a non-expert. <laughs> Europe is, in any case, in a crisis. And it is also in these days that different ministries, it's also today, just when it is a news. Europe is in this in these years and in these days, Europe is uh, once again in shame. We have been 30, 60 years, or maybe it is yeah, 60 years before, through the dictatorship, through German fascism, we have been put into a very final shame not only the Germans, but they have been doubtlessly the main actors of the Holocaust. This continent is fairly rich and has space enough to house everybody who comes there in the moment if they would be ready to open and also politically to unite. EU countries would come to a positive agreement regarding the distribution of refugees among them, so far has not been rectified. Something opposite of this, rather than opening their countries, something opposite happened. <laughs> when one country after the other, we have seen the map before, began uh, to close their borders. And this, especially in countries of the Balkan entry route, which was is, is evident, among them Austria, but also in the north, Sweden and Denmark, and also in the west, Britain and France. Now we have here this word crisis, and it is here where a lot of money is being made of, and it is not by accident that our very highly talented Minister of Finance, Schäuble, the one in the wheelchair, I think the most of you may have seen him already in TV, that he gets more and more money into his Castle, Castle, what is Castle? <laughs> yeah. Into his Börse, Börse, Castle, into his Castle. We have more money this year than it we had expected. But this is something which happens now in the moment quite often, and we get nearly used to it in expanding illegality industry began to show results not only in the field of economic profits for many actors, but also as counterproductive system which developed along the borders. If you just imagine what it needs now from, uh, from the European Union also, from the European Commission, to set up different installations, different, different houses, welcome, or centers to, to get people housing or tents and whatsoever. It is a gigantic in the, uh, industry. What might have been the motivations for nearly all the 20, uh, 28 members at this moment not to take sides of Germany of the very highly respected German Chancellor. As we know from personal experiences, what moves us, at least I know it from the experiences with myself, may not be rational and helpful at all times. And this happens to countries and their political leaders too. The EU Commission had been focused for a number of months 
had the severe financial problem of their member state Greece. The East European partners, Poland, Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, and, and others, objected to the idea of Greece further to remain. They perceived such an idea as unjust compared to the strong faults which had been applied to their countries in preparation for the entry into the Euro. The role of Germany in these struggles with her Chancellor Merkel and Minister of Finance Schäuble has been strong. The impression had sometimes seemed to many people in all Europe, it is Germany and not the EU Commission who has the lead. In this moment, the mass entry of refugees into the continent begins, and Germany is discovered as country of bliss and heaven for more and more people, not only from Syria, Afghanistan, and Eritrea, but also from Bangladesh and Bank and, and Pakistan and different African routes. The follow-up of the story is known to you. Large welcoming and commitments of German citizens, growing resistance and right-wing populist demonstrations, particularly in East Germany. Then give me an applause and I <laughs> We asked Donald Kerwin to come to address what the U.S. is doing with uh, refugees at this time, what it could do, and what it should do. So thanks to Virginia, and thanks to the Migrant Center, and to the Network for Peace um, Through Dialogue for the invitation. I'm happy to be here with you. I should say that this is the worst crisis since World War II, as you all know, and it's likely to intensify for various reasons. I, I would say that in terms of the language, this is a crisis. What it's not is a national security crisis, but it is a crisis in human security, and I think it's a global moral crisis as well. States have failed to prevent and reduce armed conflict, civil war, terrorism, breakdowns in the rule of law, and the result is what the UN, a UN official called recently a vast arc of crisis, which extends from Southwest Asia through the Middle East to the Horn of Africa and the Lake Shad Basin. The global um, refugee population consists of long-term refugees, about 45% of them have been displaced for more than five years and there's no immediate kind of durable solution in the future for them. Um, there are also many newly displaced persons. In recent years, 15 refugee-producing conflicts have erupted or reignited and um, these enduring conflicts also drag on with very little hope of a solution in sight. The crisis can be attributed to state strategies to deny protection and access to their territory through um, programs like border externalization. That is, it's basically um, once a developed state asking another state to intercept people before they reach its shores or they reach its borders. We're doing that now with, uh, with Mexico, with the Central American children. Immigration enforcement is another tool, and then very narrow legal interpretations of the law. And what, what these strategies do is they put the onus on, of refugee protection on less developed states that are in proximity to these crises. Um, and what it does to refugees is, is it means that they can't legally migrate. You know, if you're a refugee, you're allowed to migrate. Right? You're allowed to seek political asylum, but they can't do that. So they take these perilous journeys, and they're exposed to human traffickers. They're exposed to smugglers. And it contributes to a public view of them as a threat and a burden and kind of a lawless group. Only t this is an amazing fact, right? Only 127,000 people were voluntarily repatriated in 2014. 127,000, we're talking about a crisis of 60 million people. I was looking at the numbers and was surprised to see that last year only 242 Syrians had been granted political asylum in the United States. 
through our immigration court systems. Additional numbers, but small numbers, would have been through our um, affirmative political asylum process. In other words, people that came forward and weren't in deportation proceedings. And then um, 5,000 had been designated initially for temporary protected status in the United States. But you add all those numbers up, you get less than 10,000 10, in a crisis of you know, nearly 5 million um, refugees. And I think by comparison, as, as, as Monica mentioned, um, the number of first-time asylum applications last year in the EU was over 1.2 million people. We grant asylum to maybe 35,000, 40,000 people per year. But first, I mean, the crisis can't be resolved unilaterally. Let me just say that. But U.S. leadership has been and remains central to addressing situations of large-scale forcible displacement. Whenever it's worked in the past, after World War II, after the Vietnam War, after the Balkan conflict or during the Balkan conflict, after the Cuban Revolution, the U.S. has always played a leadership role. The overall need, I think, is to prevent, stem, and resolve these multiple refugee-producing crises. Thus, you know, whatever it takes in terms of diplomatic resources, in terms of development resources, in terms of U.S. prestige, in terms of its contacts, whatever. Because these crises often stretch over many years, it's necessary at the outset of them to provide humanitarian relief, but also to prioritize pooling and pulling together humanitarian and development assistance for sustainable development programs, because refugees tend to be refugees for a very long period of time. Congress and states need to, they need, and this is a, a major need, to depoliticize refugee protection. In late 2015, uh, the House of Representatives, and thank goodness this didn't pass the Senate, but the House of Representatives passed the SAVE, SAVE Act which would have effectively precluded the admission of refugees from Iraq or Syria or people who, who had recently passed through Iraq or Syria. In addition, 31 governors, this is amazing, 31 governors had vowed to bar the resettlement of Syrian refugees into their states and are fighting that resettlement tooth and nail. We obviously need to do a lot more and we need to do a lot better than we're doing. Thank you.